Committee will come to order. Oversight and Government Reform Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty in the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and secure genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I will make a brief opening statement on it. In addition to the nature that their workload, let me, let me back up real quick, the people that plan and prepare and issue government contracts play a vital role in protecting the interests of the American taxpayer. We are all familiar with stories about $16 muffins and $600 hammers being, brought up, uh, being bought by the government. But these stories often turn out to be more complicated than the soundbite would suggest. But they do reflect an underlying reality. The government must have capable people overseeing these complex acquisitions in order to properly steward the taxpayers' money. It is essential to have skilled, capable people acquiring the goods and services necessary to run a government and to serve the American people. Our Federal government is the single largest customer in the world, and its acquisition workforce is grappling with a huge increase in volume. Between fiscal year 2000 and 2008, acquisition spending by the Federal government expanded by 163 percent from $205 billion to $539 billion. Today, procurement spending is approaching $700 billion. In addition to the nature of what that workload has become increasingly complex, government procurements increasingly reflect complex services rather than just simple goods. It is a lot harder to acquire complex engineering and technical expertise than to buy office supplies. Services, not supplies, now account for 70 percent of the Federal government spending. Many experts note that the need for proper training of acquisition officers concerning the complex and frequently changing Federal contracting environment. While seismic shifts are occurring in the landscape of Federal acquisitions, the skills, tools and federal of the Federal acquisition workforce has remained largely stagnant. This further places agency missions and taxpayer funds at risk. Improving the skills of the Federal acquisition workforce is the best interest of everyone involved, the Federal acquisition workforce, the contractors, the government and all taxpayers. Two broad reforms are being required. First, how do we improve government-wide leadership in the coordination and the development of the Federal Acquisition Professionals? Defense Acquisition University and the Federal Acquisition Institute play central roles in the training and shaping of the acquisition workforce. But why does the government have so many training centers? Who is coordinating the curriculum between the civilian and military acquisition workforce to allow for workforce mobility and advancement? Should the government break training centers into centers of excellence, each focusing upon a specific specialty, such as creating an ID cadre? We just want to ask the question and let's find out. Second, beyond leadership and coordination, we must focus on the government's use of tools and advanced capabilities to equip qualified acquisition workforce professionals. Why isn't there a standardized contracts writing tool across the whole government? Why is the tracking and reporting data on the Federal Procurement Database unreliable at times and sometimes deficient? We know there are several new initiatives under ways to improve the acquisition workforce. Some of these initiatives include such programs as mentoring and intern programs, the use of flexible hiring authority, increased college recruitment efforts and improvements within the acquisition workforce career track. But we are going to ask, what else? And is it enough? And how is it going? I look forward to hearing more about these efforts today and working with the ranking member on the common ground that we do have on this very important issue. I spent a significant amount of time talking to people that have government contracts and trying to chat on what are the solutions that they see, what are the things that they, that they identify. And a lot of this conversation today will focus on the, the low-hanging fruit. What can we get accomplished? Where should we be going? And how are we doing in the progress that we are making at this point? So with that, in perfect timing, I would like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Connolly, for his opening statement. You missed my fabulous opening statement, Mr. Connolly. I will uh, I will get a tape. I am sure you will. And tonight, when I get home. That would be a terrific, that would be a terrific will, date night. I'm I will sure. watch yeah. it. But I, I do want to thank you, Mr., uh, Mr. Chairman, for convening this hearing to review the Federal Acquisition Institute Improvement Act and other acquisition personnel issues. I appreciate your attention to the issue, which is of critical importance to Federal employees, contractors and taxpayers. As you know, Senator Collins and I introduced companion bills to strengthen the Federal Acquisition Institute, and that legislation has been included in the House National Defense Authorization Act. I appreciate the Administration's support for our efforts and believe this bill will support Donna Jenkins' efforts to strengthen FAI and look forward to discussing the bill with both panels of witnesses. In addition to strengthening the FAI, it is appropriate that we would consider other acquisition work workforce policies that can improve Federal efficiency and the delivery of services. 
Chief among these are personnel policies with respect to recruitment, retention, and compensation, which are all related, obviously. As the thoughtful staff memorandum for this hearing noted, the acquisition workforce is experiencing a silver tsunami in which 25 percent of employees could retire within the next several years. The shortage would only be exacerbated by mindless attempts to slash the Federal workforce through attrition or layoffs. Federal agencies need to be recruiting the next generation of acquisition staff right now while training exists. Uh, exist, while training existing personnel to adapt to a changing procurement environment which is more focused on services and technology. In order to recruit new staff and retain existing staff, it is imperative that we maintain competitive compensation packages in the Federal workforce. While Federal employees may never be paid as much as their private sector counterparts, and indeed we recently had a study that shows uh, we have actually had deterioration in that ratio. Uh, we cannot allow that gap to widen so much that we lose our best acquisition personnel to the private sector. Fortunately, many individuals and agencies are leading the way to improve the acquisition workforce. The Administration's 25-point plan for IT reform, for example, calls for the creation of acquisition career paths focused on technology, on which OMB and FAI are, in fact, collaborating. DOD is hiring 10,000 new acquisition personnel over the next four years. Donna Jenkins has expanded the FAI staff from 6 to 9, a 50 percent increase, to meet the growing agency demands, but I, I hardly think that is adequate, and is partnering with a diverse set of agencies to maximize the impact of a very small team of experts. The Veterans Affairs Administration has opened an outstanding acquisition training academy in the National Capital Region. These are all laudable efforts, and I hope we will learn today how best we can support them, including but not limited to passing the Federal Acquisition Improvement Act. At a recent hearing, we learned about one appalling consequence of a lack of contracting oversight, widespread human trafficking among overseas con uh, subcontractors. Uh, and again, I congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, for holding those delicate but very important hearings. We must maintain a focus on this issue, because whether it is human trafficking or the failure to hold on contract costs, our acquisition personnel are on the front lines on behalf of our constituents, the taxpayer. Thank you again for holding this important hearing, and I look forward to our continued collaboration on acquisition workforce issues. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Other members may have seven days to submit opening statements or extraneous materials for the record. We will now welcome our first panel, the Honorable Dan Gordon. He is the Administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy for a little while longer. And Dan has been a forceful advocate on behalf of the acquisition workforce for many years. His role is OFPP Administrator. He has been a tireless proponent for the men and women who steward our taxpayer dollars, and we appreciate that. Recently, Dan announced his intent to leave Federal Service to join the distinguished faculty at George Washington University Law School as an Associate Dean. It seems fitting to have Dan here today to discuss one of his passions, the acquisition workforce, which was the centerpiece for his Senate confirmation hearing two years ago. I do thank you for your distinguished service, congratulate you on your new position, and look forward to continuing to pick your brain in the days to come on things that you see as um, deficiencies and ways that we can go after this and be able to solve some of the problems. Pursuant to the committee rules, witnesses will be sworn in before they testify, though. I would ask you, Mr. Gordon, if you please rise and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give this committee is the, tr is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth, so up you got. Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative, may be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, you know the drill here very well. You have been here before. Uh, we would ask you to limit your testimony to uh, five to ten minutes, then we are going to pepper you with questions after that. Your entire written statement will be made part of the record, so you feel free to be able to make oral statements uh, that are uh, above and beyond your written statement as well. I now recognize you for five minutes for an opening statement, Mr. Gordon. Chairman Lankford, Ranking Member Conley, other members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for having me here today. There is nothing that I care about more in the acquisition system than strengthening our acquisition workforce. It is my top priority. It is our top priority. And I would like to talk about a number of points in this brief opening statement. Um, I do want to broaden the scope a bit wider, uh, and you will see what I mean in a moment, because I think it is helpful to have somewhat more context. As you said, uh, Mr. Chairman, the Federal acquisition system spends in buying goods and services more than half a trillion dollars a year. Uh, that number was going up very fast between 2000 and 2009. Uh, I'm happy to report that, in fact, we have slowed that down so that in 2010 the number actually went down. Uh, and while we don't have final numbers for 2011, uh, it, it appears that they will be roughly at that lower level of 2010. 
The Federal Acquisition Workforce, as you said, Mr. Chairman, handles that half a trillion dollars a year, and it is very important that they be in a position to protect the integrity of the Federal procurement process. That is why uh, uh, Congressman Connolly's comments resonate so much with us in terms of protecting and strengthening the Federal Acquisition Workforce. When I talked about broadening the scope, I want to make clear that when we say the acquisition workforce, we mean more than our contracting officers and contract specialists, what we in the personnel system call our 1102s. It also includes our contracting officers' representatives, or CORs. In some agencies, they are called COTARs, contracting officers' technical reps. They play a key role in contract management, contract oversight, and that is a role that has been much neglected, frankly, over the last quarter of a century. I want to talk a little bit about strengthening that COR role. In addition, we have project and program managers who are part of the acquisition workforce but are often disconnected from the actual contracting shops. The, the, uh, one of the things that we have tried to do in this administration is look at that entire acquisition workforce and be sure that we are strengthening the, that whole workforce. We in OMB have been at the forefront of efforts to strengthen the workforce. Uh, as I am sure you know, the President's budget for 2011 and 2012 uh, requested significant dollar investments in the Federal Acquisition Workforce. And while Congress did not appropriate all the money that we requested, we did have some success in strengthening the acquisition workforce in a good number of agencies. But when I talk about um, broadening the scope, I want to talk about it in a different dimension as well. Because for much of the last quarter of a century, when we talked about acquisition, we really talked about who got the contract. The award of the contract was usually our focus. And in this administration, we have tried to broaden that scope as well so that we spend much more time and energy focused on acquisition planning. Because frankly, whether it is a large IT project or any other large project. When we screw up, it is often because we didn't do good acquisition planning. And then after the award of the contract, we need to do a much better job of contract management to be sure that we hold contractors to the promises they made. They did, after all, sign a contract. And we need to be sure that they deliver on schedule, on cost, and with the performance level that they promised us. Let me, in the brief time that I have, highlight a couple of the ways in which we have tried to improve acquisition planning and the workforce. Number one, our Mythbusters memo that we put out in February of this year talks about the need for our acquisition workforce to listen to industry, to talk to industry, to have better communication with industry. We can't do our job properly if we are not talking with, to and listening to industry. Second, as Congressman Connolly pointed out, we are focused on strengthening specialized uh, acquisition cadres for IT, for services, and for others so that the acquisition cadre can do a better job of planning our acquisitions and carrying them out. In terms of contract management, because of shortage of time, let me just mention that we have raised the bar for the standards to be a contracting officer's representative. We now have a three-tier certification process so that the COR, the contracting officer's representative overseeing a very large contract, is someone that has the experience, that has the training to oversee that very large contract. In the area of training, you are going to have the benefit in the next panel of hearing from both Donna Jenkins at the Federal Acquisition Institute and Katrina McFarlane at the Defense Acquisition University, I will only tell you that we have worked closely with both and done our best to strengthen their efforts and to see to it that they are working together as they are so that our taxpayer funds are being well spent. The fact is, as the stewards of the taxpayer dollars, we need to be sure that we are doing everything we can to avoid fraud, waste, and abuse and also to spend the money in an intelligent way. Our acquisition workforce, if treated properly, if trained properly, if compensated properly, can be the best protection for the acquisition process. And we appreciate this committee's commitment to improving the acquisition workforce. I am happy to answer any questions the committee members have. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Let me recognize myself initially for a first round of questions. You, you obviously walked into uh, this whole thing in motion uh, 
Uh, you inherited issues. You worked on it significantly for a couple of years, and now you are leaving other things. What is the, the next person coming in? What should be the first thing they take on? Uh, you would say th this is the this is the low hanging fruit. This is the big project. It must be done right now. I'll tell you, Mr. Chairman, my my response is going to be re related to a point that uh, Congressman Connolly made. I am very concerned, very concerned that the progress we've made over the past two years is at risk. Budgetary pressures mm -hmm. risk slashing the federal acquisition workforce. Uh, whether it's a matter of cutting salaries cutting benefits, um, showing disrespect for our Federal workforce, cutting the numbers of our people, cutting the training that they are getting. We cannot protect the Federal acquisition process without a good Federal acquisition workforce. And I am very concerned that budgetary pressures are going to unroll much of the progress that we have had. Okay. So in the task that the next person has coming in, as far as what midstream to the projects that you have got, I understand that. Because that is true of every agency, of everything that we do in every part of America and every company uh, currently. Not every, but many companies in America that are dealing with that same, same issue. The next director that walks in, what is the project that needs to be first on their desk? I think the priorities are going to remain the same priorities. Um, my priority number one has been strengthen the Federal acquisition workforce. That means for, look for opportunities for training. It means do outreach. Um, we need to, the second priority is fiscal responsibility. We need to buy less. We need to buy smarter. One of the benefits of buying smarter is that it reduces the burden on the Federal acquisition workforce. Strategic sourcing, by having vehicles in place government wide, means that individual contracting officers don't need to run competitions for contracts. That reduces their workload and is helpful. Uh, rebalancing our relationship with contractors, whether it is improving uh, the, the communication, part of Mythbusters, or seeing to it that we are doing better contract oversight, we need to be sure that we have a good balance in our relationship with our right. contractors. Can I, can I don't I think a, that can change. No. Can I ask a quick question? As, as you are listening to uh, contractors, what is the primary thing that is rising to the top? What are they saying the most? You said that is a major priority. Several things. Uh, and I do spend a lot of my time on the road. I, uh, listening is something that I learned from my mother is a very important skill. I try to listen a lot, whether it is to contractors or Federal officials or others. They are, uh, companies are very worried about the uncertainty of what is about to happen. They are very worried about the, the budget and how it is going to impact their, their own companies and their own companies' work. They are very worried about unjustified regulation which is why I and my colleagues have been so committed to being sure that we do a sensible cost-benefit analysis before we impose new, um, new requirements. They are concerned about excessive reporting requirements, both coming from the Congress and coming from us in the executive branch. I think those may be the three, but the f I, I should mention in connection with Mythbusters, because I hear this from vendors all the time, they are worried about communication being shut down. We need more communication, and the companies tell me they are worried that, in fact, too often they don't have enough communication. Do you feel like more contractors are trying to get involved in the process now or, f or fewer? Do you feel like we are increasing competition, more small, medium, large businesses are engaging in this? We are certainly trying, sir. Are, is, is it, I am trying to get a feel for it. Do you think that is occurring? I understand there is outreach that is happening. Do you think we are getting more people in the pipeline that are, that are bidding? When I look at the data, it looks like we do have an increase in competition and a decrease in sole source contracts. When I look at the number of dollars going to small businesses, I see increases. But, boy, we have got a lot more work to do. Yeah, because that is a common theme that I hear with a lot of the folks that are in my district that are trying to get engaged. It is still uh, the, the hurdles and the paperwork requirements and the processing uh, seems to be significant for them, and uh, both trying to discover what is out there or that the, uh, the rules uh, for acquiring um, a contract seem to be written specifically for a company, and they don't fit that criteria. And so trying to get involved in that. So that's uh, trying to find ways to allow more people to compete obviously drives the cost down and raises up the next generation of large companies that we're going to need to take on these big issues. Absolutely. I will tell you that SBA has been working diligently, and we've been working with them, to try to reduce the barriers to entry. It is so tough to get into the Federal contracting arena. Typically for companies, the first contract is the toughest one to get. 
Once they have gotten one and they get a feel for how the system works, they can often compete and get further contracts. But breaking down the barriers to entry is tough. SBA is trying to simplify the process and to get materials online to help companies. Right. But that is an ongoing challenge. Okay. Thank you. I yield a uh, question to Mr. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome back, Mr. Gordon. Uh, and it is good to see you again. Um, as you know, uh, I introduced H.R. 1424, the Federal Acquisition Institution uh, and Improvement Act, and Senator Collins introduced the Companion Bill in the Senate, uh, bipartisan legislation. Uh, do like your views on, on the legislation? Be helpful uh, in terms of the mission of your organization and, uh, and, uh, and workforce training? I will tell you, Congressman Connolly, that um, for us it is a breath of fresh air to have a commitment like you have shown to improving training for our Federal acquisition workforce. It is extremely important. And it is also good to see action up on the Hill that is bipartisan. It is also a good sign. I will tell you that over the years, as you know, the um, Federal acquisition is often a bipartisan issue, and that is a healthy thing for our workforce. Uh, th there are provisions in the bill that are clearly helpful. Uh, there has been some nervousness, on, frankly, on the part of people in, in, in my office that the bill's language would appear to make it look like the Office of Federal Procurement Policy would actually be running uh, FAI. Uh, I don't think that was the intent, and we need to be sure when the bill, if the bill is enacted, we need to be sure that we are able to keep having GSA and the important role that it has shown. Uh, but with that caveat, I, I do think that the bill sends a very strong signal of, of improving and strengthening the Federal Acquisition Institute. Um, yeah, just on that last point, the bill explicitly allows OFPP to delegate management of FAI to, FAI to GSA. Uh, you would prefer we explicitly just have GSA manage it without the delegation? I'm not. Sure I, I guess from our point of view in drafting the bill, we thought you've got overall management, you know, responsibility, and therefore we didn't want to in any way denigrate hmm. that responsibility. Uh, we actually thought we were being helpful, but I mean, we obviously could rewrite it to just put it in GSA. I, from from our point of view, it makes more sense to keep FAI within GSA, which is the current placement. It seems to me that you still can get the benefits of the bill even leaving FAI and GSA, because the real message of the bill is support for FAI, and that is very important to us. Uh, you know, none of us want to grow bureaucracy. But when I look, and we're going to hear in the next panel, but I mean the the comparison between how it's done in the defense world and how it's done for the rest of the civilian workforce is so unbalanced uh, in terms of resources committed to this mission uh, in training. Uh, what is your sense about that? I mean, in fact, my understanding is by default, as a result, a lot of people who in the civilian workforce who get training end up having to go to the Defense Acquisition University because we simply don't have the wherewithal on the civilian side under FAI to do the training, or at least the initial training. It is a very important issue. I should tell you, I am not sure you know, sir, I used to be a high school teacher. Uh, I care a lot about teaching. I care a lot about training. We need our training to be useful. It doesn't help to give training at a time where it's not going to help or in a way that's not going to help. Online training is one of the ways to overcome the challenge you're talking about. And DAU, as you'll hear from the next panel, DAU is working with FAI and others to share their resources in a very helpful way. Uh, it is true that when we have civilians go to DAU, DAU courses, they sometimes feel like it's not beneficial because it's so oriented towards DO, DOD. But the more those two institutions talk together and share resources together, the further our taxpayer dollars are going to go. So I am pretty optimistic about that. that that is maybe a good solution for a certain base level of training, presumably, because a contract is a contract at a certain level. But once you get into the specialization of that contract, you know, I am dealing with pharmaceutical agents and how to manage a contract on very delicate you know, clinical trials and tests and outcomes and pricing and whatever, that has nothing to do with the mission of the Pentagon, right. presumably. And so at that level, I need a different level of training to make sure I'm, I know what I'm doing and I'm protecting the public's interest. 
Where is that specialized training? Where do you think that belongs? Well, every agency, on the civilian side, yeah, every agency does some specialized training. Some of them do quite a bit. VA, you mentioned earlier, VA has a terrific acquisition academy up in Frederick. Some of their training is VA specific. Uh, I've been up there. I've I've listened to the interns that are there. I've talked to the faculty. They do a very good job. Other agencies also have agency specific training. But just to be sure, I don't want anybody to be surprised by the facts, much of the training that we get is, in fact, from contractors. And those contractors often teach at all the different agencies' training. So it is the very same teachers in many of the courses. Would the Chairman indulge just one more question, and on assuming we don't have a second round? Yeah, that is correct. I, yeah, I would yield another minute. I thank, I thank the Chair. Because I just, while we got you, I just wanted to ask your opinion. Um, one uh, two things concern me about procurement uh, and acquisition management in the Federal Government. One is level of expertise, and 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 not meaning anything disparaging at all, but as contracts grow more and more complex technologically, and get larger, and have all kinds of you know and uh, feelers associated with them, do we have the right people in place who have the training and expertise to keep up with the contractors we've just hired to manage it? And then secondly, I am worried about internal personnel policies, terrible turnover, so that there is a lack of continuity in the management of the contract. You could have many, many, many contract managers during the life of the contract, even a brief life of a contract. And I am concerned that, with the best of intentions, that has uh, a degrading effect on the quality of acquisition. I couldn't agree more. Uh, that is why in the 25-point uh, plan that you alluded to earlier, um, to improve IT acquisition, we committed to having a cross-disciplinary team that would be with the acquisition with as little turnover as possible from the beginning of the acquisition planning all the way through contract management. So we would be sharing information between contracting people and IT people, and we would have continuity. We can't have situations where we have this imbalance between us and the contractors. The contractors know way more about it than us. I've got to tell you, I was at a session with, with companies uh, a few months ago, and one of the fellows said to me, you know, Dan, I'm getting so tired of training my contracting officer's representative how to do their job. We need to strengthen our people to be sure that we have a balanced relationship. The contractors are incredibly important, but they're supporting us. And we need to be knowledgeable enough to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Labrador. Chairman, I, I yield back. Okay. Let me make just a quick comment, then we're going to close out uh, this panel. Uh, thank you again for your service and what you've done. But your comment there, um, I need to reiterate as well. I've had multiple contractors I've spoken to around the Oklahoma, Central Oklahoma area, that have said the same thing to me, uh, that they are training the person that they are working with, that they are very familiar with the processes and procedures, and that the uh, contracting officers and individuals they are dealing with seem to be very risk averse. And uh, they are constantly taking the safest route and they are having to show them, no, this is how it is done, and then they go back and run it down and then come back. And the second issue we deal with is obviously something you have alluded to as well as retainment, uh, that they start a process with one person, in the middle of it they are with another one, and they end it with another person. And uh, the continuity of the decisions and the interpretation uh, seems to move around. And uh, so uh, those are not new ideas to you, uh, but obviously those are issues that we'll have to resolve in the days to come to be able to provide some sort of consistency in the process. You want to make a comment on that? Just one brief comment, if I could. First of all, I want to thank the committee for, for the hearing. It's a very important topic. But I also want to say, when I meet with the frontline acquisition professionals, we, uh, we have a group that we call the Frontline Forum. We bring in about three dozen contracting officers and contract specialists from across the government.